Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I know everyone's joining from different time zones. Um, my name is Sabina Devan, and I'm the president and executive director of the Just Jobs Network, which is a research organization focused on strategies for employment generation and workforce development. Uh, today's conversation hosted by the Just Jobs Network is part of a uh, is part of a series focusing on the future of work in the global south, FOEGS as we call it. The Center for the Implementation of Public Policies Promoting Equity and Growth, uh, which is quite a mouthful, CPEC is the, is the abbreviation, um, based in Argentina is coordinating this project in partnership with organizations in Africa, in Middle East and Asia, uh, and these organizations include the African Economic Research Consortium, REDSER, Economic Research Forum, and of course our own network that represents the Asian Voice Just Jobs Network. Uh, the FOEGS initiative is supported by the International Development Research Center of Canada. And uh, to give us a little bit more insight on this, uh, this broader program of which the series that Just Jobs is is um, has been spearheading over the last um, week and a half. Uh, Ramiro will provide us a little bit more insight into the program. Um, so Ramiro Alberu is uh, the principal researcher on economic development within CPEC in Argentina, and he is the leading uh, coordinator of the FOEGS initiative. So with that, um, Ramiro, over to you. Thanks, Sabina, for this introduction. I'm live from Buenos Aires at three in the morning, so or at night. So I, I'm, I, I will try to be uh, clear on my thoughts. But well, um, so as Sabina mentioned, we are running this initiative on trying to understand the future of work uh, through Global South lens. I mean, trying to see the challenges and opportunities taking into account our starting point in terms of technology, skills, labor market institutions, uh, demographics, and, and so on. Uh, and so we, we have been producing research and new data on, on, on the future of work for the last years. But eventually, we realized that we needed visions, not only a new piece of research, but maybe uh, new ways of seeing things, you know, to, to uh, addressing different issues such as technology or skills. Uh, so, in a way, we 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 move our project uh, our project uh, to uh, um, trying to understand the global visions on the future of work and trying to add diversity and context to this narrative, you know. Uh, it, it, at the global level, you have like two big narratives, one saying robots are going to take control of everything. And the second narrative saying, no, no, we are going to manage technological change, technological revolutions, as we did in the past, you know. So in a way, the second narrative that is really important now, even in multilateral institutions, in a way, it, it says something like we need to repeat the past in order to succeed, you know, to manage, to confront all the problems and challenges regarding technological change. Now, when you look at this issue uh, uh, from our point of view, from the South, we don't want to repeat the past in a way, because that's why we are the global South and we are not the global North, right? We fail to confront and solve all the uh, uh, problems and opportunities uh, regarding the, regarding technology in the past, uh, so so in a way we, we 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 now we are trying to find new narratives, new visions that 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 are more uh, suitable to to our own challenges, right? Um, so uh, that's why the these uh, dialogues in these dialogues we uh, we, we try to bring these uh, sounder voices from each region. So we had uh, the first dialogue in in Sub-Saharan Africa about a month ago, like with six or or, or some, something like six roundtables on different topics. Then we have something like similar in Latin America about two weeks ago. Then 
we have the Middle East and North African dialogues about a week ago, and now we are finalizing this Asian perspective on the future of work. So the idea of these dialogues is not to present papers or new pieces of research, you know, but to, uh, in a way, uh, systematize, compile what's out there about these topics. You know, we live in this era of information overload, and maybe this is also true for research and for data. So in a way, instead of just producing a new piece of data, trying to understand what do we know and we, where, where are the blind spots in terms of our own agenda, that, that's the whole idea of, the, of these dialogues. Again, the outcome is not just to antagonize with the global view, but just to add context, add diversity, add our own structural features into this global view. Because at the end of the day, of course, the future of work is going to be the global South labor market. You know, <laughs> So if, if, if we don't manage to get better narratives, better visions and better policy guidelines on that, we are going to fail, not only for each uh, the global South, but also to the for the world as, as, as large, we can say. So uh, thanks again for inviting me here and I'm, I'm excited to learn from you and to, and to listen. So Sabina, the floor is yours again. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Ramiro. Um, you know, it, it is my privilege to moderate this session that I'm really excited about because Informality is really one of the defining characteristics of developing countries that has implications for how uh, labor markets function, for the quality of work, uh, including things like productivity and wages, how aligned those two are. And of course, the ability of policy to effectively influence outcomes. So, you know, informality is really one of those defining characteristics of the global south and of, of developing countries. Now, against the backdrop of all of these big transformations that are now taking place, you know, we had urbanization, migration, climate change, the restructuring of trade into value chains, of course, the, um, you know, of course, technology, and now the pandemic, um, you know, all of these different transformations are really upending the way that people live and work. And against this backdrop, the informal formal dichotomy often referred to as the dual economy in the context of developing countries, this, uh, this dichotomy is, is becoming a, a false one. It's becoming a false dichotomy. And uh, because economies are, are constantly changing and you know, the, the uh, informality is, is more of a spectrum uh, as is formality with growing precarity in the labor market. Um, but to really break these concepts down and to understand what informality means and how it plays out and what it means uh, to people's working lives um, to break these concepts down and really help us understand what they mean uh, you know, in, in different countries. Because as we know, Asia is also, it's not a monolith. Uh, there's a number of countries with different levels of development, different dynamics at play across Asia. Um, so even though this is a regional dialogue, we want to fully appreciate that the countries across Asia are very different. So in this context, you know, we're really happy today to uh, host the finale of the series that Just Jobs has been working on with CPEC and, and FOEX, um, and, and to welcome very special guests, including Dr. Partha Mukhopadhyay, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Policy Research India. Uh, uh, Dr. Connie Dekoikoi, who is the Senior Research Fellow at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, and Dr. Victoria Fengide, uh, Fengidai, I think, uh, who is the Senior Researcher at, um, at Pakarsa Indonesia. So with that, um, you know, welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for giving us your precious time. And of course, I'd like to welcome all of the participants here. Um, you know, as we go through these dialogues and, and, and conversations, please feel free to enter your questions into the chat box and, and we will um, address them uh, through the course of the discussion. So with that, uh, Bartho, let me start with you to really break down what informality means in the context of India uh, in a country as heterogeneous as, as India. 
um, please take it away. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sabina. Um, what um, I'm really excited to be part of this and thank you so much to you know, colleagues like Ramiro who's been up at this time of the morning. Uh, so um, I'll be brief uh, so that we can sort of have uh, much more discussion going forward. So let me um, begin by, um, I'll try and see if I can make a short presentation about just about two slides to make sure whether this uh, thing can work through. Um, so I'll just see whether, uh, okay, uh, yes, right? So, uh, uh, and, and I'm just looking at it from the point of view of India. So uh, the first thing that to realize uh, in India is that there are at least three ways uh, that we slice this idea of informality. Um, and uh, we'll talk about what my perspective on this going forward. Let me just put these three things forward. The first is, uh, the nature of the employer. So is the uh, employer, um, if the employer is a proprietorship or a partnership firm, uh, then employment in such a firm is considered to be informal. Uh, according to uh, the way we collect our statistics, our labor statistics so far, uh, which leads to this weird situation that uh, almost uh, all our lawyers and all our accountants are informal employees uh, because they're all part of partnership firms uh, to a large extent. So, but uh, so uh, that's just one of the curious things that happens when you sort of use that kind of structure. The second is uh, whether or not the employer is registered under some act, and we have a number of uh, acts under which these kinds of registers, we're happy to sort of talk about them as we go forward. Um, but let's say there are things like shops and establishments, when you open a small shop, you have to re register under that particular act and that entails you some of these structures in place. Uh, and the third is whether or not, the first two are therefore dependent on the nature of the employer. The third is dependent on benefits to the worker. Uh, does the worker get leave? Uh, does the worker have health insurance? Uh, does the worker get pension, provident fund, and so on? Um, and that's the three kind. Of, and the third is sort of a more ILO kind of approach to looking at it. Uh, and if you look at these three definitions, those numbers can be very different. So the first thing that we're looking at in a country like India is, do we or do we not count agriculture? So when you hear numbers in India, from India, which says, you know, 90% are informal and things like that, a lot of them are essentially counting agricultural employment. And you can counting all agricultural employment as informal. And since somewhere around 45% of employment right now is informal, uh, is agriculture, therefore, that automatically means a lot of informal employment. But if even if you leave out agriculture, the broad numbers can vary quite a lot. So, for example, what you have is if you're looking at, let us say, uh, ownership, which is the first definition, then, and this is um, data from 2014 15, but not, um, and the Recent, uh, we, we're doing different kinds of surveys now, but we haven't done a full fledged uh, survey of that magnitude yet. Uh, you're looking at ownership in terms of people who are employed by firms which are not proprietorships and partnerships is about 22%, right? Uh, but A lot of the proprietorships and partnerships are actually registered under some act or the other. So of that 78%, 
Bartho, we seem to have lost you. You can't. Sorry, your uh, your audio is going in and out a little bit. Oh, this time. Uh, okay, this is better. I think we can hear you now. Also, Partho, if it's possible, can we turn your video on as well? Sure, but uh, the video and the audio are delinked. So let me check. Uh, is this working in terms of the audio right now? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, so I could start the video. That's fine. And then we can take it. Okay, so... Uh, the... Uh, so if you look at the registration story, then a pretty large chunk uh, is actually formal. So you're looking at 58% um, uh, to be formal, which means about, uh, so these are all, sorry, these are all percentages of formal, not percentages of informal. So, but again, if you go back into benefits as to whether the worker has certain benefits, whether any one of the benefits, whether it's leave, whether it's health, whether it's pensions, et cetera, formally provided, that number again drops sharply to about 17%, right? So it depends on whether, how you're looking at the issue as to whether you're looking at formal registration or whether you're looking at benefits. Now within benefits, one of the main innovation that seems to be happening now in India, and I'm sure it's happening in other countries also, uh, is that you have a situation where you're delinking employment and benefits. So you are moving to, let's say, universal health insurance, you're moving to universal pensions. And the question there is, under such a situation, how do we think of formality and informality? If basically the employer is not providing these benefits, but these benefits are being provided by the government, right? So that's where we need to, and since this is one of the critical definitional issues that the ILO uses, I think we need more clarity on that space going forward. The second uh, side, uh, the third question that sort of uh, Sabina posed for us is what happens uh, what happened during the COVID storm? And, and I'll just keep that um, to the broad headline numbers in place. First, obviously, because um, there was little employment protection in most of the uh, firms that we've seen uh, on the other side, whether they were registered, whether they were uh, proprietorships or partnerships, uh, except in very large firms, there was very little employment protection. And therefore, once demand dropped uh, in the early part of the pandemic as a result of lockdowns, uh, a lot of people were just let go. Right? And there was uh, an, um, an intersection with uh, migration that we can talk about. Uh, but broadly speaking, uh, what you had was a lot of people lost their jobs in the immediate aftermath of that say in India, which is roughly in April, when the country went to a full lockdown, uh, a lot of people lost their work, right? The flip side, of course, is when it's we, India started to come back out, which is about two months later in July, uh, that India started, the economy started to pick up. Uh, the Rehiring was also quicker, but at the same time, and here the issue with migration comes in, a number of employees may not have come back to their original places of employment because they were unsure about finding work. And because they were unsure about finding work, they were unsure as to whether they'd be able to survive in the city. And given that there were certain social security benefits available in the villages, such as a guaranteed work program, a number of the re-entry of people into the urban workforce, especially at the lower levels, was slower. Right? And you had 
fairly high unemployment rates continuing throughout most of last year. The third thing that happened was even though work increased, the nature of work changed. So a number of people who had regular employment were being paid regular wages, et cetera, especially in the bottom half of the earning scale. So let's say uh, if you are a low wage worker, the chances are based on data from the CPHS survey that we have, that a large number of people who were in salaried employment, as they're called, which means they were getting a regular wage month to month, they moved into daily wage working. So a lot of people's work condition changed for the worse and became more precarious over the course of the last year. So these are the three broad sort of trends that we have seen. So uh, with respect to COVID and the overall labor market. In addition, the effects were accentuated by gender. So which means that women were among the first to let go and the last to re-enter the workforce going forward. Broadly speaking, I mean, there'll be differences across sectors, but that's the overall big picture. Uh, I think I'll, uh, you know, stop for now, and then we can come back to uh, discussions. Going. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for for that, Partho. I think. Um, you raise a number of very important points, I think, that are sometimes overlooked when we're talking about informality. People refer to the, you know, refer to informality as, as you know, the informal sector, but really what we're talking about is these two realities which you've articulated in the definition, which is the enterprise definition of, of informality, which is an either a, a proprietorship. Um, or uh, an unregistered business, which comprises in, like an informal enterprise. And then on the other hand, you've got the benefits dimension, which signifies uh, when there's an absence of benefits, that is what we call uh, informal employment. So a person is in informal employment if they have an absence of, of benefits. And I think this kind of nuanced take on defining informality is much more conducive to actually, uh, you know, understanding how to address it than when people kind of lump all of these concepts into one and say informal sector, which just seems like this very nebulous concept that's kind of hard to get your arms around. So, so I think that that's um, really valuable. So thank you for breaking that down for us. Uh, next, we have um, Connie. So Connie, if you could kind of give us uh, some understanding of what informality means in the context of the Philippines and how it's, you know, how it's being impacted, what the size of the informal sector that we just spoke about is in the Philippines and how it's being impacted by COVID. Hi, thank you, Sabina. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So in the Philippines, um, informality essentially, um, we they define it based on the Philippine Statistics uh, Authority's definition, uh, official definition. So informality has something to do with the household enterprises that are unincorporated. So, and then there are two, uh, two options here. One would be the informal own account enterprises, and the other would be the enterprises of informal workers. So essentially these two are household uh, enterprises but they are not uh, they are not uh, corp uh, in, they are not incorporated um, so the, the here what I'd like to focus more on is the idea that um, uh, there are several uh, terminologies that can uh, that are used to represent uh, informal workers in the Philippines and um, the, uh, our colleagues at the Department of Labor and Employment um, uh, had actually uh, compiled some sort of uh, terminology. So, and then and, and, and this um, uh, 
these many terminologies can actually have uh, implications in terms of people's understanding of on, on what really informality is all about. So for example, um, uh, there's a there's a term that there, there's a terminology that that says uh, freelancer. So if, if you're a freelancer, you can also be classified as an informal worker. So sometimes uh, they are called self-employed professionals. Sometimes they are called sole proprietors uh, or independent contractors uh, or entrepreneurs, even part-time workers as well, and even platform workers. So this uh, there's really no um, uh, there's so much. Um, terminologies or, or uh, yeah, terms that, that are used to, to, to depict the, the situation of informal workers. That, that is one thing that I, I can share. So, and, and, and in terms of, of uh, size and, and trend, what, to, what the uh, PSA had, uh, had documented so far is that um, informal employment, it accounts for a very high percentage of the total employed person. So based on the 2018 um, labor force survey, uh, around 62.8% of the total employed persons, which are uh, by, by employed persons, we mean these to be greater than or equal to, I mean, 15 years old and above, they are uh, considered to be working in what, they, what we call the informal sector. So I will be using informal sector because that's, that's, that's um, uh, I mean, you were saying something about informal sector earlier being this nebulous term, but um, at least in the Philippines, that, that's what what we that's what they say. Informal sector as a sort sort of catch all uh, term to represent uh, this this type of workers that are not into the formal uh, economy. So and and then so sixty three percent, sixty two point eight percent of the total employed person are considered uh, considered to be working uh, in this uh, informal economy. That, that's one. And then second is the prevalence of informal work uh, among men and women alike. So Parta had, uh, uh, had uh, also mentioned uh, uh, the gendered aspect of informality. And the same thing is also happening in the Philippines, except that um, the, based on the labor force survey uh, in 2018, uh, males around 66.7% are in the informal economy, while 56.4% of females are in the informal uh, economy. So uh, males, uh, female, uh, males rather, are, are um, they, they have a higher proportion uh, working in the informal economy, but, but uh, it has to be taken in the context that only um, uh, only one third of the total employment are female. So um, the, the female um, working population of female is around uh, a third of the, the total working population. So that, that can probably explain some sort of disparity of this uh, this uh, uh, informal uh, uh, arrange uh, informal uh, figures among men and women. And then by sector, uh, the same data would show that agriculture and industry are, you know, evolved, agriculture rather, agriculture and industry that are involved in the unorganized sectors have increasing shares to the nominal GDP. And this, the data that, that uh, was uh, uh, shared by the PSA would be from 2006 to 2016. So from that period, the agricultural share um, uh, involved in the unorganized sectors would be from it, it went up from 67 percent to 96 percent and then uh, uh, regarding industry uh, from that same period uh, the percentage would be 22 percent to 31 percent so only in services has the unorganized sectors contribution shrink 39 percent in 2006 and it became 35 percent in 20 so in terms of the pandemic, um, what I'd like to share here is that um, um, the impact of the pandemic we're still beginning to understand uh, because we still have to uh, analyze data as new data are coming in. Although looking into the readily available uh, uh, labor force survey, um, there are three observations there. One is the increase in the informal employment, and when I say informal employment, this is something to do with these. These are these are uh, uh, own account workers, so self-employed, with pay uh, uh, involving uh, family-owned business, and without pay uh, involving family-owned business as well. So, uh, using informal employment to 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 
to talk about these own account workers. In 2010, the size of this informal employment is around 42% of the total employment. And then uh, prior to the pandemic 2019, it has declined already to 30 but in 2020, it has already increased by four percentage points. So, um, so we can see there some sort of uh, correlation. Although, uh, I mean, this is just a correlation because we still haven't done uh, some sort of uh, rigorous uh, method to understand if it, that indeed is really an effect. And then, second would be that underemployment has increased. Uh, uh, sorry, unemployment has increased. So from January uh, 2020 versus the January 20, uh, 2021 labor force survey, um, the unemployment rate has uh, uh, has been from 5.8 percent. It, it became uh, 8.7 percent. Um, sorry, uh, 8.7 percent uh, in 20 January 2021. And then uh, the third one, the third uh, figure that we are, the, what, that the, the third figure that I'll be sharing with you would be the underemployment has also increased. So when we say underemployment, these are people who wanted to, to work more, but they, they couldn't find any. So underemployment rate has increased from uh, 20, uh, to January 2020, uh, 14.8%. And then in January 2021, it increased to 16%. So definitely, uh, even though these are just some sort of uh, uh, you know, correlation or, or nothing to do with causation whatsoever, we can see that the pandemic, uh, the effect of pandemic, uh, the pandemic has accelerated the digitization of work. Um, and we all know that here, at least here in the Philippines, it has created a new work arrangement that is aided by technology. So this includes this include the development of online market uh, spaces. So people are now selling online. And then e-commerce, people are participating in uh, online platforms like Lazada, Zalora, uh, Shopee. Um, and then there's also the development of digital labor platforms. So this uh, type of, uh, of work can be considered as part of the informal, the broad uh, uh, term informal economy based on the existing definition that we have here in the Philippines, which has something to do with being an own account workers or workers in the household enterprise that can be sole proprietorship or, or jointly owned by by um, by uh, households that are not uh, that are not incorporated, and then uh, I'd like to share in terms of the digital labor platform work. Uh, I just want to share that uh, you know uh, based on the online labor index uh, that's collected by the uh, Oxford Institute, um, around 25% of Filipino online workers they are performing clerical and data services, uh, and this is. You know, it says something about the kind of skills that the Filipino workers have, Filipino online workers have, um, because uh, 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 comparators, looking at, at its comparators like Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, and Pakistan, uh, only around uh, less than 10% of their online workers are doing this type of task. So it, has, it, it says something about the kind of skills that, our, that the Filipino online workers have. And then around 14% of Filipino online workers, they are into software development and technology, which is really small uh, compared to the online workers from, again, comparators, India, Pakistan, and Vietnam, which is really, really high at 59%, 49%, uh, 45%, and 52% respectively. So if you if we, that is the context that uh, that uh, that I'd like to share with you, and we can say uh, we can talk about this um, uh, more. And I'm going to stop here for uh, to, to, to give way to the other speakers, Sabina. Great, thank you so much for that, Connie. I have so many questions for you, and I, I'm I'm going to wait till the end. But some of the points that uh, really struck out for me is is sort of the phrase that you use that the. The definition of the informal sector in the Philippines is kind of a catch-all and we'll come back to this but one of the questions that comes to my mind about these kinds of catch-all definitions in reality it doesn't sound that much different than how we are defining informality in India it sounds pretty similar um, and then and of course, overlaid to that, you have the ILO definition of whether there are, you know, uh, social security benefits or not that defines informal employment. But it, it, it sounds uh, pretty uniform across the way that we are defining informality in India and in the Philippines. But this kind of catch-all uh, definition of informality, 
we'll come back to this, but I'm, I'm wondering how it affects policymaking and the ability and the efficacy of policy, policy to actually uh, you know, have levers to adjust to economic shocks and, and to be able to make economic changes. And this is a question we'll come back to. The other thing I think that you pointed out that was really interesting was just the whole, uh, the, the fact that, in, you know, there's, there's fewer women in informal employment than men. And then you explained uh, as to why that is. And I, I think that that's, that's also kind of an, an interesting finding. And, and finally, uh, something that also stuck stuck out to me was, you know, in India, through the course of the pandemic, we've seen sort of a, a rise in unemployment, a decline, a right? It's been somewhat volatile in terms of the uh, unemployment rate. And part of that is because we are seeing what Partha was describing, where, uh, you know, the nature of work is changing. So people might be going from what are considered formal jobs to daily wage work that are then considered informal, um, just to make ends meet. It sounds that that kind of volatility has maybe not been as pronounced in the Philippines where uh, you've seen kind of a steady rise in unemployment as well as in uh, underemployment, um, but then the, the informality has also been rising. So you've seen kind of an, an, a rise in, in all three aspects. And so, you know, um, so that kind of question about that volatility and people moving between what is considered formal and informal. Um, I'll, I'll stop there and maybe if you have a quick response, we can you can response, respond to some of this now or we can also come back to it at, at later on um, if you have something. I, you know. I think, Sabina, if I, if I can, if I have an option, then I would rather uh, go back to it uh, in a bit because that's a lot and I, I have to think of the... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, sorry. I mean, your presentation had so much in it. Um, and, and just to say that part of this series, uh, a few days ago, we also had a, a colleague, Matangi uh, Krishnamurti from, from IIT Chennai, who, who did a very interesting uh, Facebook Live session looking at the bi business process outsourcing, which is now often called business process management, looking at sort of the Indian trajectory and, and the Philippines trajectory. So some of the statistics that you pointed out at the end are also very interesting in the context of, of that discussion. Uh, but anyway, I will just, those are just some observations. Um, so with that, let's go to our our, our next speaker, Victoria, if I could turn to you to also give us the sort of Indonesian picture. Um, again, how, how do you define informality in Indonesia? What is the size of the sector? And, um, you know, and how has this uh, changed or, or been affected by the pandemic? So let's um, hear the Indonesian experience. Over to you. Hey, thanks, Sabina, for the opportunity. And um, I will just uh, go straight if I can. So, yeah, so it's um, it's basically just the uh, overview of data. I myself just start to refresh my knowledge in Indonesia after uh, some years uh, being retreated from the real world. So, uh, yeah, so what's What's the informal employment is statistics Indonesia or BPS just refer to the international standard classifications of employment. So I think the ILO, ICLS, and all those uh, standard standardization institution at the international level define there are seven categories of employment status, and usually what used as uh, informal employment is the blue ones. So number one, number two, five, six, seven. So everyone work as casual workers in agricultural and non-agricultural, definitely the unpaid or the voluntary family workers, employer assisted by temporary worker or unpaid worker. That number two is a mixed because you can be an enterprise and you can hire temporary worker or unpaid worker but your enterprise itself can be registered. So that's number two, usually it's a bit uh, mixed. And number one, the self-employees, or I think the LO changed this term uh, a decade ago, something from self-employee to on-account worker, which means you work by yourself. 
So we can see all these contractors, um, consultants, uh, all those kind of jobs uh, fall within the number one uh, on account worker criteria. So this is what uh, usually BPS use as informal employment. And in terms of enterprises, usually it's just like in other countries, it depends on the size of enterprise, how many workers they employ, they employ size of capital and the, the turnout of the, um, the, the, the sales registration status usually. So the in, in the informal uh, reflects the in as in insufficient. So everything that formal sectors doesn't have, it's in the informal sector. You can see that wages and working hours and regulated statutory wel welfare benefits is not there. The government encourages the, uh, uh, the informal enterprises to register their, their workers, but it's, uh, yeah, it's still difficult because many of the, even the formal companies, the so-called formal companies, not yet registered. And uh, it's basically it's other name for micro and small medium enterprises. And actually I put the um, quote for informal because uh, the government, I think they uh, doesn't officially um, define enterprises as informal and formal, but medium, small, micro, uh, large. So this is the situation in Indonesia. Um, the data is quite um, confounding because you can find different sources with different figures, but that's why I just quick took from the Excel of the BPS uh, website. And the, it's, uh, this is, so the orange is informal and the blue is formal. And they're always be like go side by side between 2011 to 2019. So this is before pandemic. And in terms of uh, percentage, you always have at least half of the population work in informal sector. So they are informal workers. This goes are about 40 million people. And for the, the third notes, it's about uh, the impact of COVID pandemic. This is, uh, there are a mix of uh, information out there, but I look from the, some of the press uh, media reports from the BPS and they said that the increase because, um, yeah, the increase in official data is actually not that much, but you can see the, the different discrepancy in this. So informal sector increases 1.18 million, not too many. Formal sector decreases 6 million, a lot. So where do the, uh, the discrepancy goes? I suppose they go to underemployment, unemployment because this is the employment. Um, and more than 80% of companies experience drastic decline in income. That will go to the uh, reduced wages and most significant impact suffered by SMS and low value added companies. So you can see that SMS fell income by more than half of their uh, income before pandemic and large companies are nearly, nearly 30%. But that's uh, the problem I think that is faced in not just developing countries, but in developed countries like in Australia, for, for instance, that I know, uh, the government provides like subsidized income for enterprises that are registered. And that, that means those that are not registered flow out of the government safety nets uh, in terms of uh, like subs income subsidies from the government. So that's, that's the, um, the shortcoming. And there are some data from uh, BPS. So what companies do is they reduce working hours and increase operational hours and make their workers work from home without pay. 
So in statistics, then you can make sense why the decrease of uh, employment is not that much because this different strategy that companies took to address the uh, the fall in the uh, the sales and the profits. So larger sectors that felt the impact is manufacturing, processing, construction. The, these are the sectors that many uh, informal workers work on. And 76 of companies did not reduce number of workers, but reduce working hours. So we will see, we will probably have seen what that means for workers because the prices and everything don't, don't go down, but the number of, uh, number of working hours reduced, it means the, the pay, the wages that they receive also reduce. And uh, you can see that from uh, BPJ, BPJS is Indonesian <coughs> Social Security Administrator, memberships drop nearly 5%. So 4 million workers drop out from the um, employment occupational uh, social security schemes of the, uh, the government. But this figure can be tricky because the membership of BPJS occupational is still very low. That only um, offers less than one third of the total workers. So majority of informal workers not there, and those informal workers already lost their uh, social security as well. So this is really uh, worrying of what the figures can tell you and what the figures don't tell you. And this is interesting about the digital and um, informal workers who are either uh, categorized as um, formal workers or those in informal uh, sec sector, like digital economy says about the um, creative business actors that 90% they experience cancellations, those work in filming, talk show, concerts, those uh, performing arts, there's like 90% of them just uh, canceled, so they don't receive uh, income. 70% of business operators, research field surveys, uh, many of the um, uh, research could, be, could not be done in the field because of COVID. And, all the training and workshops, events, meetings to just, just stop like 65% of them and 50% of business actors cancellations they're meeting with and in uh, tourism. So you can see that the move instead from formal tourism to informal uh, tourism, like to 250,000 people suffer informalization instead of formalization because of because of profit. Uh, that's uh, that's the um, overview of the of the data, and yeah, I think for some of the um, the idea that digital economy creates work opportunity, we could probably uh, review that from different kind of. Uh, the different kind of uh, what you say indicator. So you, you can see that many of the digital gig workers impacted also by uh, COVID pandemic and many of the creative workers, media workers, they are categorized as digital workers, but they hit one of the worst uh, by uh, COVID pandemic and they are out there without protection, without social protection. So that, that will be challenging about what digital economy uh, contribute to, to, to the um, welfare of the workers. And I think in that sense, it's not the binary of informal or formal, but you, can, you should go to whether this kind of work provide uh, decent 
decent wages, decent working hours for workers rather than formal and informal because uh, they will go to your other questions about the um, formal and the, the challenge the challenge of um, informality, flexibility and stuff. So they can go there. They can they can be formal, they can be informal, but is that a decent uh, the job for them that can provide them and their family? So I because one thing about the digital economy is that the role of institution, because it's the platform now, the algorithm that regulate how much you get, how much bonus you get. So our research uh, with Just Jobs Network back five years ago and with Sydney University three, four years ago, we found that people like the workers in the uh, digital economy, the ride hailing motorbike riders, they, uh, they complain about the bonus, the decreasing bonus over time, but that all regulated by algorithm. So what you input, that effect, what will you get? So how many trips you do, how many kilometers, how many passengers you take, the algorithm will regulate that. Not government, not this, the, not Gojek or Uber, like what, what's the role of Gojek and Uber? They are employer for their staff, like their admin staff, but not for their drivers because their, their driver status is contractor as well, as we all know. So they're still in informal economy. And the state, what, what does the state will do with this, the new economy of algorithm? AI, we don't talk about AI, it's, it's, it's too dystopian for many people now, but algorithm is very real because algorithm decides how much you take home that day for your family and what's the state role. I think the, the redefinition of the role of the state, the redefinition of the role of employer, employees, and, and either employment, working, are they still relevant in the, uh, in the coming years? Uh, they're already a bit less relevant for the workers. Now, like the Gojek drivers definitely don't see much of the government roles. Government, government like stays outside and the algorithm, the platform decides what you get, how many hours you work, and not the Ministry of Manpower, for instance. So that, that, that will be an interesting but challenging development that uh, probably we can discuss that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Victoria. You've raised so many excellent points. Um, just to draw on a few of them, I think, you know, starting with where you ended, which is the digital economy and the idea of you know, the fact that some of these changes um, in, in terms of the new emerging forms of work with the with the gig economy and so on are moving much faster than the ability of institutions to actually be able to regulate them. Um, and I think that that's fundamentally important because, you know, whether it's the role of platform intermediaries or algorithms that we know sometimes have you know, biases built into them, to what extent does the online economy based on algorithms then replicate the prejudices and biases that exist in the offline economy? Those are all really important questions that, you know, still need uh, investigation. And in the meantime, this phenomenon of, of technological change and the new emerging forms of work is is happening very, very fast. So, so I, th I think that's a, a really important point. The second is also, you raised the point about, you know, people being able to make, it doesn't matter if you're formal or informal, but at the end of the day, people need to be able to make a decent wage in order to be able to support themselves and their families. And I think in the context of that, what is also really interesting is, you know, um, at least in, in so far as the platform economy is concerned, is it really creating new jobs or is it just taking work that existed before and 
breaking it up into smaller pieces and distributing it across a wider group of people. So, yeah, yeah, please go and, ahead. Yeah, like, and we add that because our survey a uh, few years ago so that they actually shifted from formal low wage formal employment. So people like security guards, uh, all, all the, um, the clerical staff in companies, they are the most, uh, the, the largest number of people who move to become Gojek drivers. Mm -hmm. So that, that, your point is, is right. They, they're not really creating new employment, but it's a, a shift from what in statistics says formal employment, because as a security guard, you're, you're registered at some point, although recently, I think most of them are outsourced, which means they become casual workers, but uh, the company is registered, but then they're even moved from formal sector to informal sectors. If you think about the, uh, the statistics definition of that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, no, uh, definitely. And I, I think that's exactly where I want to take this discussion, which, which also your data pointed out. I mean, you said that post COVID, the government data suggested that there was an increase in informal employment of about 1.2 million, uh, but a decrease in informal employment of 6 million. So what happened to those other, <laughs> that, that gap? And I mean, it of course could be people dropping out of the labor market, but it, it also is, um, you know, the, the again, this, as you said, breaking down of these binaries or breaking down of these dichotomies, because there is increasing precarity in the formal sector as well, where you could have workers that are employed in registered enterprises, but don't have benefits and therefore are in informal employment. Or you could have, as you said, low wage workers from the formal sector entering what is typically called the, the informal sector. So, you know, it is a very, uh, I think a, a complex network and, and heterogeneous um, environment with different people moving in and out of different kinds of jobs, which makes it really difficult for policy, uh, first to keep up with the pace of change and second to actually have levers to, to actually uh, address the plight of people in the economy because there's, it's su such a heterogeneous group. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the big question, and, and you know, with this, I can maybe go back to Partho first and, um, and then go in the same order. But the big question is, you know, there is a lot of discussion across various groups, multilateral institutions, experts, scholars, academics, all about, you know, formalizing the informal sector. And my question to you is, is this even, is this even a relevant and viable goal, given the current scenario that we're in, particularly in the context of these new emerging forms of work. So uh, Bartho, if I could first maybe turn to you and, and we'll go in the same order, but I'd like to pose this question to all of our panelists, because I, I think it's a really fundamental question in terms of, uh, you know, it, are these new emerging forms of work First of all, is the is the formality to informality to formality goal a relevant and and viable one? <clears throat> and then second, in the context of these new emerging forms of work, is that even even possible? Um, so Partho, over to you first. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Sure. Uh so I think uh, so what he just said is uh, we definitely, in my own opinion, I think we definitely need to move away from this binary discourse of formal and informal uh, because uh, we are looking to formalize, but we are not sure what that end game is. Uh, because there is really no clear definition of what formal is, right? Uh, I think what we now need to do is to move uh, to clear identifications of attributes of work 
So for example, uh, does the work come with uh, a certain, how much certainty do you have about your earnings? So one of the issues that comes up about gig work and algorithmic payments and uh, payments on the basis of work and deliveries is the extent of certainty over earnings. Is there some kind of floor um, earning that you have in that particular space if you are a partner with one of these enterprises? <coughs> Excuse me. Then there are issues about availability of benefits in terms of health, uh, whether or not health benefits are available uh, through the public sector. Uh, and then, you know, enterprises may or may not contribute. That is a way of financing that particular uh, thing, which is a fiscal decision from the point of view of the governments. Similarly, uh, retirements, which is pensions um, and provident fund, et cetera. Uh, is that something that is provided as part of a national pension scheme? So the second story is to look at attributes that re refer to retirees, that refer to health benefits, et cetera, to see whether or not that's been provided to the worker, whether it's been provided by the firm or whether it's provided by the government uh, is, a, is a secondary issue. Uh, similarly, uh, issues about, uh, which is important from the point of view of the employer is issues about leave, uh, and especially with women when it comes to issues about uh, and men in some sense, uh, parental leave um, uh, uh, that comes across that space, what happens uh, in those kinds of structures. So I think what we need is a continuum of these kinds of benefits and an understanding over what proportions of workforce are, have these kinds of benefits going forward, which then gives you a more uh, sort of um, it's a shaded view rather than a black and white view about what the uh, formality and formality story in the workforce is. Uh, and also enables you to think of two kinds of transitions. One, the transition, and this is an important transition from our, uh, because in the West, what you have is a transition that's happening from very defined formal work uh, even in places like, say, Amazon, et cetera, where you're having a certain work per hour, but you have a clear treatment of benefits, to when somebody goes from working for Amazon to working from Uber, there is a certain set of changes that takes place in that. But on the other hand, if you're moving in India to going from working for a transporter as a truck driver uh, in informal work to working for Uber, uh, how does that change your employment status? And in, in one way you could see as if, if you stay within the formal informal dichotomy, I think these transitions are going to be difficult to pick out. Whereas in actual point of view, in terms of labor market outcomes, these transitions are important transitions to track and keep account of. And therefore, uh, when you, have a situation like you have, let's say, with uh, Uber, you were able to, because of their record of employment, you're, even if the government wants, it can provide benefits. If the firm wants, like, for example, vaccination, it was able to provide certain benefits to those, uh, to its uh, uh, partners or employees or whatever you want to call them. And uh, Whereas if the person was in an unrecorded employment with a transport firm, then it would have been harder for them to get that kind of benefit going forward. Right? Similarly, uh, if the government wishes to pay a certain, uh, enroll people in health insurance schemes, in public health insurance schemes, it's much easier to work through uh, gig working platforms than would have been to try and aggregate a large section of the informal workforce. So it's in the ability to implement certain outcomes that the changing structure of the labor market becomes important. And therefore it's important, I think, for us to keep track of those uh, structures as they go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Partho. I mean, 
always a, a wealth of information in, in your remarks, including just teasing out the, so you know, we spent a lot of time defining what the informal sector means and the definitions, but there is a growing sense of ambiguity around what formality means as there is more and more precarious work in the formal sector itself. And so with all of this, um, you know, these sort of multiple definitions, I think moving away to thinking about um, the attributes of work and thinking of it, uh, uh, the attributes of work related to a continuum of benefits, I think makes a, a lot of sense in addition to all the points that you raised about the, uh, the, the transitions and the contrast between the kinds of transitions between uh, the global north and, and, and the global south or the west and, and the east, how, <laughs> however we wanna talk about that. Uh, Connie, uh, same question to you about your take on the sort of the idea of the form, informal and formal sector and formalizing the informal. What are your thoughts on, on this? Is it relevant? Is it viable? What are the dynamics that you see? And if you have uh, proposals, you, and you're also welcome to react to what the other panelists ha have said. So this is, we wanna kind of have this as an open conversation. So if you have a reaction to the way that Partho has suggested moving to a method that focuses more on the attributes of work tied to a continuum of benefits. Um, we can sort of get your take on, on all of this. Uh, yes, yeah, Sabina. Actually, I agree with uh, Parto and Ria uh, about uh, rethinking. Sorry, can, I, can I request the speakers to please turn their cameras on? Uh, if all you right, uh, wait, wait, you. A second. wait a second. Wait. Thank you. wait. Because your is minim, I minimized it. Sorry. There. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. So uh, I actually agree with Barto and Ria uh, about the idea that we should rethink this um, binary uh, formal informal work. Although uh, uh, when I hear the uh, term formalizing the informal, uh, honestly, what comes to my mind is, um, you know, uh, the, the idea of the decent work principles. So my take is that for as long as we are uh, formalizing the informal uh, in the context of the decent work principles, then that would be okay because formalization means, you know, having this career development and providing social protection uh, and fair contribution in taxation, social dialogue, and other things. So that is the ideal. Uh, however, um, um, there are substantial challenges to the adherence to decent work principles. So for example, in the case of the emerging online work or platform work, which Priya had uh, already discussed. So, uh, and I, was, I already pointed out earlier that, uh, you know, uh, there's this some sort of many definition, many terminology, uh, and, and there's so many that there's really no uh, clear, very clear definition, which definitely impedes the determination of applicable standards in terms of uh, what, what are you going to apply in terms of if you're going to give a social protection, what, what, what kind of social protection are you going to provide if you are a contractor, if you are an entrepreneur, if you are a part-time worker. And you were right earlier, Sabina, when you were saying that what are the effects of having, uh, having this different um, uh, terminologies on policies, it definitely uh, has a lot of effect because, for example, if you are a contractor, if you're quali classified, if you uh, classify yourself as a contractor, then you are not covered by social protection schemes. But if you consider yourself as an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur or you are one that's involved in enterprise, then uh, if you are registered, then, then you can avail of the training and mentoring programs of the Department of Trade and Industry. And then uh, just like there are many subsidies for the COVID, uh, from the COVID-19 policy responses that are related to these needs. So it depends, um, you know, this, this kind of definition, whether you, whether you classify yourself in this definition, um, 
you will be able to benefit some and, and, and others will not. So it definitely has some policy levers in terms of being able to define. So uh, the issue here is, you know, if we move away from this uh, dichotomy between formal and informal, then then there have but there has to be some sort of definition, uh, definition. And 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 uh, my thought is that um, it should the, the protection, the social protection schemes, and and all the entitlements. It has to follow workers and not the other way around. Because here in the Philippines. Um, the social protection schemes are all largely tied to formal employment. And that is probably the reason why uh, it, it rings a bell when you say formalizing the informal, because what we wanted to do at the end of the day is to be able to adhere to the decent work principles, be able to give social protection, be able to provide benefits, uh, housing benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So that, that, that is the, the, the key here. Um, and, and then so the policy labor is, for example, um, one thing that I'd like to point out as well is that uh, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, emerging online platform work and platform work that Ria had already uh, mentioned, I was saying something about the definition. And then uh, there's also the issue of this fluid work arrangement and then uh, people can move from one category to another. And the lack of portability of social protection schemes, at least here in the Philippines, uh, it, it results it results in the disinterest of people, you know, the, the disinterested attitude of people towards contributing to social protection schemes. Because, you know, if you, you, you uh, contribute to one, to social protection, if you transfer to, let's say, another, um, another uh, work arrangement, then it will not be carried over. So it, it's as if um, it's some sort of wasted. So that the, the kind of mentality has to be corrected. Um, and then in terms of entrepreneurial activities, I was pointing out earlier the proliferation of online selling, e-commerce. Um, uh, the issue here uh, uh, issue here is the attitude and the general distrust in the government. So when you say formalizing the informal, naturally there has to be a government that, that will step in. So who will formalize? It has to be the government, right? Or, or at least the government has a role. Uh, but, you know, uh, people, they might have a different attitude towards government and the attitude can be in general be called distrust. So for example, uh, the government right now is encouraging online sellers um, in, in popular platforms like Lara, all these uh, people who are involved in e-commerce and even the influencers, they are, um, they are asked to register their businesses. But this is not well received because sellers are immediately thinking of taxes. They are going to be taxed, and I'm just earning this much, and then you will step in, and you will get a lot from me if I if I register myself. So because registration is part of, you know, it's it's one way of the government to formalizing the informal. And then there's this paperwork that's related with all these uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, requirements. So I I think that that's one of my take in this. Um, in, in this uh, issue of formalizing the informal, Sabina. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Connie. Again, a, a lot of information there uh, and, and also just the efficacy of policy that is tied to these different types of definitions. I thought it was really interesting you know, that as an entrepreneur, if you're classified as an entrepreneur, you have access to certain benefits, which contractors don't. And these kinds of definitions in an economy where people are also moving in and out of different kinds of work um, and, and, and changing sort of um, work or jobs uh, or tasks even, uh, these kinds of, uh, of, of policies and, and the applicability of government policies, particularly social security becomes really difficult to implement and, uh, and large swaths of people actually fall out of the safety net. Um, and, and then that of course has adverse impacts, I, I believe on the resilience of people at a time when you're being confronted with massive labor market change, the pandemic and so on, if people aren't, if they don't have access to these kinds of social security nets because they don't fit some kind of definition that the government has of who gets to access these benefits and who doesn't, then your economy as a 
whole becomes a lot less resilient. Um, and, and so, no, I, I think that, that these are really uh, difficult issues. And, you know, we definitely need to also think about, you know, what is it that, that needs to happen in order to be able to resolve some of these definitional issues? And, and they're not just definitional issues. They're also a matter of if we say, okay, then the government should provide universal social protection for all workers, regardless of attributes of work, then we run into fiscal questions and what kind, you know, how do you, how do you pay for it? Who pays for it? So, um, but let me, let me turn to you, Victoria, and give you the same question to answer. And then what I'd like to do is uh, to actually just uh, come, come back to the panelists at the, at the end to spend just a couple of minutes answering this question about, well, so, so what's the path forward now? This is clearly a very complex phenomenon. Uh, we want to break down this binary. We want to see more workers have access to social security nets and safety nets to build resilience of, of families, people, and economies. But, but how, do we, how do we do that? What needs to happen next? So first, uh, Victoria, I'll turn to you and, and just ask you about the you know, formality, informality. You know, should we be formalizing the informal? Is that viable? Is that relevant? So just comment on that, and then we'll come back to, uh, to all of the panelists just to give us some of their final thoughts on potential solutions. So Victoria, over to you. Um, yeah, I think I will, I, I agree with what Parta and Connie have already mentioned about you, you should definitely redefine work and provide the social security in the continuum of uh, benefits despite of employment uh, status, which I saw the comments from uh, Rasmi Satya on the chat. Yeah, that's exactly like number two. It's the problem that my my thesis now is working on because of the the categorization of the social insurance uh, for for workers. It's that is the problem. And for the developing countries, the global south, that's. Uh, I will pose even more problem than resolution <laughs> because for the formal sectors, compliance is already hard, like JAMSOSTEC or BPJS employ employment in Indonesia. It's, uh, they didn't really increase their memberships among formal workers over decades. So it's, it's, not, it's not increased significantly. And I did my field work two, three years ago uh, uh, in in Greater Jakarta and in West Java, and I found so many companies. Like on the paper, they are registered as company with more than one hundred uh, workers, factories, but they don't pay the uh, premium, the social insurance premium. And what they did is to let the workers register as poor people, so they get the subsidies from the government. As, as poor people, so they get the subsidized schemes instead of the uh, of the shared mechanism between employers and, and employees in traditional social insurance. So yeah, my, my thesis actually asked the same thing. Social insurance is an institution created in 19th century Germany. <laughs> well, industrialization is at the height, uh, at the peak of industrialization in the West. And everything is so regulated. The society is pretty much well stratified. Everything is in their nice compartments. And we've never seen that in developing countries. You want to define something, you, you're going into chaos just straightly <laughs> because it's really difficult to define, reduce everything into their boxes. But yeah, I still agree that some of the the, the inequality is oh, one problem that we probably haven't haven't touched you haven't touched here because even among what categorized as informal enterprise and formal enterprise uh, it's some people just get away with it I think Prakarsa work a lot with the tax compliance and uh, tax uh, tax ratio tax uh, adherence in Indonesia and found that a lot of companies like big companies don't comply, they don't register. So they're, they're categorized as informal, informal, uh, informal enterprise, but their sale 
is like billions. They go under radar. And in that sense, I will agree that formalization is important because as Sabina mentioned that we have fiscal, fiscal problem here and someone has, has to do the bad job. <laughs> Uh, making sure that there is money to be redis to redistribute through all the social protection schemes. And for that sense, I agree with formalization, but I know that I'm for the uh, small medium enterprises, registration is a nightmare because even when at the time you want to register your business, they ask you to pay 70 million. You're not even sell anything. You haven't sold anything. But the 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 uh, bent, uh, the red tapes in every other corner of the <laughs> registration offices everywhere will ask for you fifty million, even if your startup capital is like thirty million. So that and that's like that's real stories. So that will be um, that I know that that wouldn't be a nice um, uh, um, step to formalize, but. We have to agree, like Parta says, that oh, Connie or Parta, I see mentioned that we have to clear first that the government and the state is still there, playing their role as regulator, because someone is someone has to be there. Like if uh, <laughs> unless you want the economy to move quickly to the sort of cryptocurrency <laughs> where it's the market decides everything and everything. So, but I think in the employment, you still have the uh, regulatory role of the state. So if you redefine the uh, attribution of work, you should also define who will be the jury to make sure that things happen, to make sure of compliance, to make sure that benefits paid to those who, who work for it. So yeah, I think that the if you decide uh, we were in agreement that the government is still relevant <laughs> or they're now irrelevant. So and how much relevancy you need from the government in, in regulating all this fluidity uh, and flexibility. This, and this is interesting because flexibility as a um, as something that's that's very difficult to catch in the old system of social insurance and stuff because people move from jobs to jobs and from task to task and from employer to employer, um, you, you still have some point uh, improve your taxation, for instance. That's how at least has been done in the developed world. So this, you cannot just talk about employment or manpower ministry, you talk about financial sector as well. So you talk about bank or digital banking or the payment system. So now people pay from their mobile phone. So <laughs> how do the government make sure that the, the transactions uh, are known and make sure that uh, the, the workers get what their labor they, they labor paid for. So it's yeah in, in the end you of course the formalization also should, should be should be stick to the, the, the purpose, which is to humanize workers, uh, I think. Formalize or informal, inf, formal sector of informal sector, it's in the definition, but uh, someone has to be there and the workers must not be dehumanized of all these processes, uh, I think. That's, that's my um, two cents. I hope it's helpful. Thank absolutely, you. absolutely, Victoria. Thank you so much for, for adding these insights. And I think, you know, uh, the, the question of, of um, the relevance of government at a time when the efficacy of policy is weakening because of the dynamics. How do you, so I, I my own personal position is that we need to strengthen governance and we need to strengthen governments. Um, and, and the ability to, of governments to regulate. But, but of course, there are so many dynamics at play here that are, you know, uh, the, 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 the way that bureaucracies function, the asymmetries of power with, with corporations that, uh, you know, and, and the, the 
field of compliances that companies have and how they get around compliances or don't get around compliances, the differences of the applicability of compliances and, and benefits across businesses of different sizes. So uh, a, a lot of uh, questions there and a, a lot of very, very important work that clearly still needs to get done. And I, I think this discussion has been just absolutely incredible uh, in terms of laying out a lot of these issues. And I feel like we need to make this a, a monthly thing uh, with, the, <laughs> with you all because you're just such insightful uh, researchers that have added so much value to this discussion. Um, we're almost out of time. So I just quickly wanted to, uh, you know, I, I think Resmi brought up some points that you addressed already, Ria. You know, uh, one question that Partho brought up, which is what kind of this, what kind of structure helps to improve uh, work conditions in a world of SMEs and self-employed persons, um, and and also, so this is one question, and I, I don't think we have time to answer that question, but um, but the idea of of just what kind of structures help improve working conditions in a world of SMEs or businesses of different sizes as well as, so I'm broadening part those question out a little bit, as well as um, you know where labor markets are so fragmented and you have so many different kinds of um, attributes of, of work. Uh, Ramiro also raised a point about, you know, when you were talking about Germany, uh, Victoria, Ramiro said, these institutions match the emergence of the big factory and the big governments. Um, and that's the story of the North, but maybe it's not the story of, of Asia. And I, I think that's that's right as an, as an observation. Um, and I think that is very much aligned with what you were also trying to talk about, both in terms of uh, big factory and, and the evolution of governance. And I think something that we've sort of touched upon, all, I think all three of the speakers have touched upon, but we haven't kind of isolated is the social compact, right? The ILO's tripartite structure, the extent to which workers, employers, governments work together uh, and, and work out some of the distribution of the benefits of, of growth, which, um, you know, with a stronger social compact in uh, some of the global North countries, certainly some of the Western European countries, it, it's a very different dynamic in the countries in the global South. So, um, so just wanted to point that out. So with that, uh, I, I actually think that we are out of time now, but if there's any final burning remarks that anyone wants to make, we have about two minutes um, and I'd be happy to, to take any final thoughts, comments that, that anyone has. Um, does anyone want to add something at this point? Quick, uh, uh, because one of the things that we, um, the question that you posed was whether the government was taking steps to address informality in the country. And I think what has happened as a result of the pandemic is that uh, governments across the world, I think, are more focused or at least thinking more about workers and what kind of conditions workers are in. And therefore, it, this might be uh, a good moment to shift the discussion towards, as Victoria was saying, and as Pani was saying, we need to think about benefits and structures as something attached to a worker, rather than something attached to a relationship between a worker and a person. And it is that uh, shift that I think there is more um, uh, there's no fertile grounds for that kind of discussion at this time. Uh, and I think there might be, uh, um, it might be useful to try and seize this moment and advance that particular discourse a little bit further. That's the uh, one issue I'll make this time. Thanks. Yeah. No, absolutely, Partho. And thank you for, for ending this discussion on what is an, optimis uh, an optimistic note about a potential window of opportunity in the aftermath of what I hope will soon be the aftermath of, of the pandemic. Um, 
I wish, uh, you know, really uh, want to thank all three of our panelists, Victoria, Connie, Partho. Thank you so much for a really enlightening discussion. Of course, Ramiro, thank you for your partnership and collaboration uh, and for running the FOIX program. Um, so with that, thank you to all our participants for joining. And, uh, and I hope that we, you know, take away some of the, the messages and the, and the optimistic note that Partho has, has ended the discussion on, which is a window of opportunity for us to really think about what a 21st century economy should look like uh, for the global north and the global south, but recognizing that there are different dynamics at play and how do we create a, a world that is more inclusive, where, uh, you know, where we're not caught up in definitional uh, issues of formality and informality, but really keep the eye on the prize, which is how do we create, you know, more and better uh, work, more and better opportunities, the, the ability for workers to, to pride for themselves and their families in, in remunerated, productive, and um, uh, an optimal uh, work arrangements. So with that, thank you all for being here. And, uh, and I wish you all health and safety in, in the days and weeks and 